Hello, I'm Jen Wilson, Senior Programmer, and welcome to this Film Independent Presents Festival Visions Edition Q&A. Special thanks to our lead sponsor, HFPA, our media sponsor, KCRW, our virtual screenings partner, Vision Media, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Today, we're spotlighting the feature film Runner by Marian Mathias, which played in the 2022 Chicago International Film Festival. And with us to do the Q&A is the festival's artistic director, Mimi Ploche. Welcome, Mimi. Thank you. Um, hello. As uh, Jen mentioned, my name is Mimi Ploche. I'm the artistic director of the Chicago International Film Festival. And it is my pleasure to be here today with Marion Mathias, director of the film Runner. Also, a big thank you to Film Independent for including us and the film in this Festival Visions program. We're super excited for audiences across the U.S. Um, to be able to see this amazing film. What brings you to Illinois? I'm here to bury my father. Need a ride? It's about to pour. We were honored to present Runner last year at the 58th Chicago International Film Festival in our new director's competition. Um, the film has enjoyed so much success um, around the world, winning the special jury prize at the San Sebastian Film Festival, as well as the Ingmar Bergman Award for Best Debut feature at um, the Gothenburg Film Festival earlier this year. So first, congratulations, Marianne. Oh, thanks, Mimi. It's been such a ride, and we're really excited to be doing this festival's visions, too. It's been a journey, and we hope to have some good conversation about the film. Great. Well, I'm just going to get started. Um, you know, one of the things I think that really struck us, you know, we do feature a lot of films from kind of Chicago and Midwest at the program, but run in our, in our festival program each year. Um, but one of the things that we were struck by, I think was like, and me in particular was a real, the, just this really strong sense of place that we feel in the film. Um, you know, the film is very kind of rooted in the Midwest and it's in its visuals and in its aesthetic and its character. Um, you know, there's these amazing expansive landscapes, um, the dramatic skies, um, these really strongly drawn horizon lines, um, which uh, I really responded to. Um, you grew up in Chicago, which is a large yeah. city, but not too far removed from the rural Midwest. So I was wondering if you could talk about your personal connection to the landscape and what it meant to capture this um, in the film um, and to kind of take a narrative that is so kind of firmly rooted in that landscape. Yeah. Well, so I'm from Chicago, but my family is from the Midwest. So my parents are from Illinois, different parts of Illinois. And then my um, my grandmother, actually, who is who the lead character, Haas, is named after, is from a part of, um, I guess you'd say, Southern Illinois and Missouri. It's called Highland, Illinois. And it's just on the, it's basically on the edge of the Mississippi River. So um, there's a little bit of that origin story with my grandmother, but also she um, lives in Michigan. So a lot of my family is based in Michigan. So I've spent a lot of my childhood growing up around there. And it's in, in a more kind of rural area than it would have been in Chicago. So very used to seeing these landscapes. I kind of grew up with them in a lot of ways. And I was lucky to grow up and have sort of that taste of the city, but I feel like I was most at home with these open skies and these wide landscapes. It's like 
I live in the part of Brooklyn where I feel like it's the only place where I can kind of see sky, you know? And um, so, but yes, in the American Midwest and especially in these areas, I've just been drawn so much into just like the narrative uh, storytelling of this place. You know, there's been, there's just, you can drive for miles and you see one house and then, you know, for another, you drive five miles and you don't see another house. And so I kind of wanted to start the story with being like, you know, how can you be close when you are so physically far apart? And so that kind of built up some of the narrative and the character building as well. And the part of the film is just a character, which I consider, which you brought up, Mimi, is just the horizon line, you know, it's like, it's just, I love a horizon, just like a clean straight line, you know, in a lot of ways, I feel like the horizon line is where the earth meets the sky and the dead with the living. So it's sort of, to me, is just like a very strong symbol that is aligned with the themes of the story as well. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to talk a bit more about the aesthetic of the film. To me, there's something really painterly about it, you know, from the framing um, to like going back to that well-defined horizon line, this the angles and the sense of perspective that you create through those angles, as well as kind of those dramatic high contrast landscapes um, and also the interiors, which are kind yeah. of um, almost a counterpoint to the exterior landscapes with these dark interiors, but then the light um, in the windows being bright and kind of always ever present, the kind of that sense of, of the outside on the inside, but the light never truly penetrating. So I was hoping you could talk a little bit about, um, about this aesthetic. To me, like immediately I started thinking about some of the paintings of like Andrew Wyeth, but so I guess this is a two-part question. One is like working with your cinematographer to achieve yeah aesthetic, but also any kind of references that you were drawing um, upon for the um, for the look of the film. Yeah. So I do kind of come from a fine arts background. My grandmother, who I mentioned before, is a sculptor. So she sort of, and my mother does painting as well. So they sort of raised me with this you know, I was always going to museums or it was always in conversations or the books that I would open or, you know, would be a Wyeth book or, you know, maybe a little bit more abstract. They kind of are more <laughs> into abstract stuff, whereas I was more into, you know, American pastoral kind of works. Um, so I thought well, since I had this kind of background, I thought, well, you know, to me, what's interesting is how to treat filmmaking like it is, you know, each scene or each shot is like a painting or an image, you know, try and treat it that way. You know, it's, it's, I make it static. And it was a really kind of a fun challenge for Jomo Frey and I, the cinematographer, to kind of think about like the, the sequencing of the images and how we can kind of craft light or even with the production designer, you know, it's like how the focal point of an image can actually just be some, a very lonely chair. And with, if it's just an empty chair, you know, who sat in that chair, the absence of a person, you know, how, how, how much can we pull or create from just a single static image? And it's hard, it's really a hard, it's hard. It takes a lot of work to do it. It's like you're crafting your own painting and they're not everywhere, you know? So you have to really build it and find it. And it takes a lot of work to find the, just the right location and has the right light. And, you know, we try, we worked on a very minimal budget. So it was just like trying to pull out as much you know, um, painterly aesthetics as we could and with just very, you know, minimal, um, you know, supplies. So there's that. And then, you know, um, oh, and then the second part of your question was, oh, it's just about were there particular references that you had, yeah. whether it was painting or sculpture or drawing or, or, um, or just even kind of personal memory that you were drawing from? So I, so yeah, to come back to what I was saying before is that, you know, I kind of was, just I was raised going to museums and stuff and I, I was just so lucky to have that in my life so I remember when we were location scouting at the at the house where Haas lives in um I remember I was walking down we were kind of all perusing the property and I kind of went off to the side on my own and I remember just kind of going down the hill 
um, and looking back up and seeing the house and thinking, oh my gosh, that really looks like, you know, the Wyeth painting of the Christina's world. We got, we have to shoot here, you know? And then it became an ode to, that shot sort of became an ode to that painting. So we have Wyeth and then there's, you know, some Hopper in there and um, and some photography too, like Dorothea Lang. Um, I mean, I can go on and on about the influences, but those are just a couple. Great. And I mean, I think one of the things um, that you create through this also, this aesthetic is this, there's a sense of a timeless quality um, to the film. Um, you know, this, like you were talking about kind of looking for these landscapes, but also the characters, the way that they move through the landscape, they travel by foot or bicycle. And then of course, by train, um, they're talking on landline telephone. <laughs> yeah. Kind of yeah. These intrusions of the modern world, except maybe kind of this reference to kind of flipping properties along the Mississippi river. Um, so I guess how important for you was it to kind of, take away kind of this sense of like time markers um, or remove kind of this kind of contemporary references. In yeah, the a part of the, the film, you know, our, our aim with the film is to get rid of all modern signifiers mm -hmm. because I wanted this story to really feel like it was suspended in time or it could, it could exist at any point in time. It could have been, you know, 40 years ago, or it could, it, it's a story that could also be told today. You know, it's something that we're all faced with in our lives. Unfortunately, it's just the loss of the people that we love. It's the ultimate thing that it's, uh, it just makes life so beautiful, but it also makes life so devastating in the same way. So I wanted to make it kind of like an elegy in that way. And so I figured just get rid of a cell phone, make it a landline, you know, because also in these areas, I find, you know, my grandmother and a lot of places in the Midwest, it does feel suspended in time. Sometimes some of these towns, they haven't been updated since, you know, the 30s or the 40s. And so I I feel like that's also sort of an ode to the Midwest in a way. It's, there's still a lot of landlines out there <laughs> in some of these spots. So. Yeah, and the telephone wires and that we see. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so... Huh. Um, so that kind of leads into kind of, I mean, when I think about the telephone, this question of like sound and communication and and music in the film um, and the role that music plays or, or silences also play. Um, so first I want to maybe on a narrative level, um, kind of the role of, of music in the film. Um, so Haas is first scolded by her father um, with that first song that like the hymn that they're singing in church for not singing along, but there's yeah. this that she's not connected at all um, to the music because she said, okay, we haven't been going to church. Why are we going now? Um, but it also seems to be like a connector to, to the outside world. Um, and then of course, when we see her listening to kind of Hank Williams, I saw the light on the radio, okay. uh, it becomes almost a, maybe a personal anthem for, uh, for Haas um, in the film. Um, so it's kind of both her connection to the outside world and maybe like a guide for her future or her anthem. So I was um, one, how did you choose the songs and like, like this, how did you kind of the process of weaving them into the narrative um, and the way that you see the role that music plays in her life? I just gave you my interpretation. No, so. I'm, maybe I'm loving all of these too. And I, it's so exciting for me to hear interpretations that are almost even more eloquent than I could even say. <laughs> yes, you know, yes, that's exactly what I was going for. And it's also, yeah, it's very special for me to hear it interpretation so please keep them coming but um for the Hank Williams song I actually it was just one of these things where I had well first of all shooting the film was like such a light in my life it was just such a wonderful time it, we began shooting it sort of at the end of our lockdown their first period of lockdown so all of our collaborators kind of came together in this one hotel that um we were Luckily enough, they had just allowed us to stay there. <laughs> um, but I remember waking up one morning and just singing that Hank Williams song, I Saw the Light, and I was just sort of humming it. I just love that song. I love Hank Williams. And I was singing it, and um, Darren, who plays Will in the film, you know, heard me singing it too. And so he, you know, was, was 
hesitant, but he was also kind of humming along with me. And, and it was the first time I sort of saw a glimmer of, you know, Darren and who he is. And so it made us feel connected in this way where we were just like, oh, and then a friendship started to form and all this stuff. So um, Hannah, who played Haas, had never heard the song. So then we just kind of incorporated that into the filmmaking and it actually ended up just being such a poignant powerful song and it just felt like it just fit so perfectly into the narrative I mean you were talking about darkness and light and the spaces and where Haas is inside and 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 feeling claust- it feels claustrophobic and she feels trapped and then all of a sudden she's in a new landscape and the horizon is enormous and vast and all the light she's just washed in light and so it just became an anthem of the film, but it also became an anthem of her story. And we were lucky enough to sort of kind of capture her learning the music real time. So I love that. And the two of them in the field kind of yeah. trying to figure out the lyrics together. Yeah, because because Darren, you know, kind of knew it a little bit. So he was kind of teaching her how to do it. And it ended, it ended up being one of my favorite scenes in the film. Yeah, kind of this moment where they're kind of like of intimacy, where they're getting to know each other as the, through the song. Yeah. And, you know, so since we're talking about music and sound, I mean, I also, you know, was really interested in kind of the quietness of the film, but also the soundscape that you do create and the sounds that you decide to in- include, you know, whether it's the um, sound of the train in the distance um, or um, the sound of the river, um, which we don't see, but is kind of always a, con- yeah. a presence in the film, the wind, the rain, um, and also, um, you know, Will talking on the phone, describing the sound and the silence before the rain, um, I suppose to the family um, that's somewhere else. So so could you talk about your approach to kind of the use of sound and kind of um, the counterpoint of silence in the film? Yeah, definitely. I would say, you know, we, as much as I like to say, you know, f- a film is a visual medium, it's also a sonic one too. So I really wanted to approach this film. It's like, you know, if you had close your eyes, you know, and just listen to the film, what would you learn or what would you gain? And would you feel a narrative arc here? And so that's what we kind of approached with the sound recordist and the sound designer. It was just like building up the soundscape as much as possible. I mean, we became, I mean, if you watch the film and listen to the film again, we became so obsessed with just little tiny narratives that happen in the soundscape. You know, at one point, I remember we have a bird that kind of starts tapping at the window as if it wants to get in. And, you know, we're like, we're going way too far here. But it ended up just being like, you know, it is such a, an audio, visual, audio visual medium. So we just went all out for that. And then, yeah, you know, just the silence is just... I live so much of my life in silence and I feel like it's, it's being unafraid of the silences in the film. It's just, it's also like being unafraid of the darknesses too. I feel like in so much, and it's frustrating, I think for audiences, and it's been really an interesting journey to see audiences reaction to not only silence, but also darkness, you know, we're kind of uncomfortable in darkness. We're also uncomfortable in silences. So you know, it's, it's, it's been um, quite an interesting journey to seeing what audiences respond to, but also what they don't respond to and, and kind of playing with that a little bit. Oh, Mimi, I think you're right. Oh, I, I, um, <laughs> um, I feel like um, it's interesting to think about the way in which um, you're also playing with kind of this, these themes of loneliness, but also connection. Um yeah. Or maybe even like redemption through connection and how you explore those themes in the film. Um, And then especially working with kind of the characters of Haas or Hannah and Will. Um, Can you talk about kind of how you worked with the the two actors to kind of create that relationship Um, and also about casting them um, for that um, kind of relationship or that that kind of quiet chemistry between the two of them. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I feel I s- feel so lucky as a director to have been able to work with both Hannah and Darren. They come from very different acting backgrounds. So Hannah is an actress based out of Germany. She's a star, you know, in Germany too. She's in so much. 
so much stuff out there and her work, her body of work at, at such a young age is remarkable. And Darren actually is, um, he comes from um, the Blackfoot reservation in Montana. So he is just, he is, has like um, just a knack for um, authenticity. You know, he is such an authentic performer and he's just I like to say that he's probably one of the most generous actors I've encountered because he just gives so much of himself to the project. And, and Hannah is very similar too. I mean, she would craft, she would come in already having kind of crafted nuances of Hannah's, of Haas's behavior too, and her personality. So they just both were just very present with one another. And I think really excited to just be, on set mm -hmm. Hannah was excited to be on set in the States and and Darren was also just this is his first feature this is his first film so he was just you know had that excitement coming in too so they were both just really ready to work with one another and um, learn from one another so that's how they were both found and they ended up just kind of having a natural chemistry and friendship and that's just one of the best gifts that a <laughs> director could get I would think yeah, no, it's uh, uh, really nice to kind of those like quiet moments of interaction between the two of them, like starting with the first scene together when she hops on his uh, bicycle. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, I feel like we can't not have a have this conversation and not talk about kind of the, I guess, the scenes of m what might be considered like the chorus of townspeople um, that entered, I think it's twice in, into the film, kind of in the lower left hand corner. Um, kind of looking at the house and commenting on kind of the action that's happened or um, kind of thinking about kind of like or describing what they would imagine Haas's kind of interior kind of reaction to what's happening around her might be. Um, I, I felt like on one hand, it seems to be connecting kind of with this idea of kind of community or small town life in which people are observing, commenting, maybe even judging, um, but also um, giving us insight into kind of Haas's interior. So um, can you talk about kind of the decision to include this device um, in, in the film and, um, and yeah. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I call the, those two scenes, or I guess, yeah, I guess just two of them, the Greek chorus of the film where it's, you know, onlookers looking onto this one girl's narrative and kind of imposing their own fears or their own judgments or their own, um, yeah, mostly, you know, their own fears onto this young woman's life. It's like, there's this expression that I think about all the time, especially having grown up in the city, but also spending a lot of time in the crunch in the country is this like wh whether or not you'd like to be a small fish in a big pond or a big fish in a small pond. And I feel like in Haas's narrative, it's, you know, maybe she'd rather be a small fish in a big pond, you know, see, and, and be a little bit anonymous and have her own sort of independence. But when you're in a small town like this, when tragedy happens, they ex they're explosive. And all of a sudden you're on a stage that you didn't ask to be put on and everybody's kind of nitpicking each part mm -hmm. about it. And one thing and you also mentioned earlier, it's like a little bit about loneliness. It's like, for me, it's actually, there's, there's this, this differentiation between loneliness and solitude. You know, and I see Haas as someone who actually is a character who is okay with solitude, solitude and independence, you know, uh, having her own kind of different trajectory of her life. Whereas sometimes loneliness can be imposed upon you, or it's like a group of, in, in one, in, in the second vignette is that there's just a group of these women kind of looking up at her and saying, you know, I can't imagine what it would be like to be alone, you know, and it's just kind of, um, their own fears putting being put onto her life. So I wanted to bring that out um, a little bit in the film, just to yeah. highlight her independence a little and where she's actually at. Yeah. And I think that relates kind of 
to my last question, which is about the ending of the film where, I mean, she's clearly in a position where she's able to make choices or is comfortable making choices about what's next for her. Um, so I love the ending and that it's so open, letting us, the audience, consider kind of or imagine what futures lie ahead for both House and for Will. Um, I don't want you to explain or to speculate about what happens next, but I'm wondering um, you know, just kind of that choice that you made about keeping the ending open um, and that decision. And how did you, having made that decision, how did you land on those final scenes or images? So, you know, initially when writing the script, I, you, you, you would laugh at the script a lot because in a lot of it, it's just the, there's a, a line that's just, she walks you know, and it's just like, you know, a scene, 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 she walks, scene, 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 she walks. And, and um, so much of it is a just, you know, time alone and just processing, you go for a walk to do that, you know, to kill time to be outside away from the house, etc. But she then, you know, she walks, she walks, and then she, she bikes for a second. And she's just suddenly she's biking with this young man. And all of a sudden it's not walking, it's biking, you know, and it's just a totally different thing. And then she returns home. And, you know, for me, it's, she's not walking anymore. She's not biking, you know, she's running. So here she's actually, she's changed. She's different now. And it's a really simple, really simple thing that really, if only you'd really had read the script, you'd under, understand how I saw sort of like a poetry in that. It's like people touch their lives, whether or not they, they realize it or not. And you change and alter your behavior. So in this one, it's like, it ends with just her, her running. So that's, that's one answer to that. That's great. That. Yeah, I think there's maybe one other time when she runs in the film, um, when she's learning of her that her father has passed, right? Or yeah, she yeah, something yeah. is wrong. Yeah. Um, great. Well, I love it. Um, so again, congratulations on the film. Thank you for this great conversation and um have a great time on Bergman Island. Yeah, thank you so much, Mimi and Jen. It's been such a pleasure to show the film and we can't hear we can't wait to see everyone's and hear everyone's reaction to it. Thank you.